Hello everyone, my name is Eddie Jackson, and today I will be doing a financial management project on Uber and Lyft. Um, this is for my Finance 403 class with Professor Chatterjee. The purpose of this project is to analyze the financial statements of Uber and compare them to Lyft, which, is, which would be their competitor company. Um, today, we'll use the following equations to evaluate both companies. We'll use current ratio, quick ratio, average collection period ratio, accounts receivable turnover, inventory turnover, average age of inventory, inventory to net working capital, total asset turnover, fixed asset turnover, fixed charge coverage, basic earning power, debt ratio, debt to equity, long-term debt to equity, times interest earned. We'll also be using total profit margin, operating profit margin, net profit margin, return on investment, return on asset. We'll also be using return on equity, price earnings, market value to book value, cash flow per share, dividend payout, and we'll also be using dividend yield ratios as well. We'll also evaluate the following companies using accounting measures. So we will be using total net operating capital, net operating working capital, gross investment in operating capital, net operating profit after taxes, free cash flow, operating cash flow, return on invested capital, market value added, and economic value added. We'll also use the ratios, the ratio values and accounting measures to show performance trends of the company for at least five years, which I have here. Um, and we will also compute the cost of capital on both companies as well. So as I said before, my main company that I will be doing is Uber and the competitor will be Lyft. So, First, before we get into all the financials and get into the Excel, I want to talk a little bit briefly about what Uber does and who Uber is, um, for some of you that don't know. So Uber Technologies is one of the rail hailing companies, I'm sorry, Uber Technologies is one of the ride hailing companies providing mobility as a service to consumers. The company operates services like taxis, food delivery, couriers, and package delivery through the Uber platform. The supply and demand factors are used to set prices, facilitating dynamic pricing. Partnerships with other brands have enhanced the company's growth since its launch in 2009. Current statistics estimate the company operates in 72 countries globally. Notably, Uber experiences stiff competition from competitors in the industry like Lyft. Some companies portray performance from asset management, while others, it is from profitability ratios. So Uber's performance. So the financial analysis of Uber shows that the company is doing well in profitability and asset management. The performance is attributable to the gross bookings made on the rides and the constantly lowering costs. Notably, problems with drivers, employee strikes, the pandemic impacts, and commissions should be of greater concern to management as they may impact Uber's future profitability and performance. This is, con this is, this is considering the prevailing inflation, which has affected the company's stock prices. Okay. So Uber still has an advantage for continued growth due to, the mark, due, to the, due to its market positioning and expansion to global markets. New initiatives applied by the management should regard improvements to company performance despite the prevailing economic conditions. Okay. And so now that I've given you a little rundown of who Uber is and what Uber does, I want to go over the board of directors and management for Uber as well. So for the, for the board of directors and management for Uber, we have Dara, Dara Kay, who is the chief executive officer. We have Nelson Chai, who is the chief financial officer, CFO. Um, we have Jill Hazelbeck, Hazelbaker, who is the senior vice president, marketing and public affairs for Uber. Um, we also have Nikki Kay, who is the Chief People Officer. Um, we have Tony West, who is the Chief Legal Officer. We have Gus F., who is the Vice President, um, Safety and Core Services. Um, we have Pierre Cody, who is the Senior Vice President of Delivery for Uber. We have Al Albert G., who is the Vice President of Platform Engineering for Uber. Um, we also have Sandeep Jane, who is the Chief Product Officer and SVP of Engineering for Uber. Um, and lastly, we have Andrew McDonald, who is the Senior Vice President of Mobility and Business Operations for Uber. Okay, and so now that we have Uber out the way, um, I want to go ahead and I want to move on to its competitor, which is Lyft. So I just want to give you a brief rundown over Lyft as well. So 
Lyft was launched in 2012 by Green Zimmer and Logan Green as a carpooling and share riding company. Initially, the founders named it named it Zimmeride before changing the name in 2013 to now Lyft. Under Zimmeride, the company offered per to peer, sorry, under Zimmeride, the company offered peer to peer ride share matchmaker matchmaker services for people traveling long distances. The change resulted in the founders selling Zimmeride service to enterprise holdings to focus on the growth of Lyft. Like its biggest competitor, Uber, Lyft offers the same services in the U.S. and selected cities in Canada. Its expansion to Canada was in 2017. Was 2017. The services range from rental, service, rental vehicles, ride hailing cars, and food delivery to the bicycle sharing system. The original Lyft provides rides up to three people, Lyft XL for five passengers, Lyft Lux for luxury vehicles, um, how about that? Um, and then also Lyft Black for premium black car service and Lyft Black XL for premium black SUVs carrying up to five people. The company receives a commission, uh, the company receives a commission from each booking made through Lyft services. Also, the, also dynamic pricing is utilized based on supply and demand metrics when booking. The company's growth has experienced some tremendous challenges since the services were launched. For instance, in 2014, riders experienced bumps when impacted the number of consumers for the brand. In 2014, Lyft initiated the share ride idea to offer cheaper fares to service users. Despite the challenges, the, the company continued to grow and form partnerships. One of the profound partnerships occurred in 2018. Lyft partnered with Off Scripts, creating a platform which allowed healthcare providers to arrange rides for patients having issues with healthcare accessibility. Okay, and then so now I just want to move on to the board of directors and management for Lyft. Um, so we have Logan Green, who is the chief executive officer, co-founder, and director. Um, we have John Zimmer, who is the president, co-founder, and vice chair for Lyft. Um, we have Sean Argerwall, who is the board chairman. And we have a few directors here, such as Ariel Cohen, Valerie Jarrett, David Louis, and co David Richard, Maggie Wilderwater. Okay, so now I want to go over the financials of both companies. So first up, we have the current ratio. So the current ratio is a liquidity ratio that measures whether a firm has whether a firm has enough resources to meet its short-term obligations. So now I want to go over Uber's um, current ratio for 2017 all the way through 2021. So for 2017 Uber, we have 0 0.977. Um, for 2018, we have 1.44. So it dropped, I'm sorry, it raised a little bit. For 2019, we have 2.4, raised tremendously. Um, in 2020, we have 2.03, so it dropped just a little bit. And in 2021, we have 1.777. So now I wanna move on to Lyft's um, current ratio. So Lyft current ratio. So for Lyft current ratio, um, in 2017, we have 3.67, um, and then in 2018, it dropped a little bit to 1.6, and then in 2019, it dropped a little bit more to 1.32, um, and then in 2020, it dropped a little bit more to 1.25, and then in 2021, it dropped a little bit more to 1.10. Okay, so now I want to talk about the average collection period. So the average collection period is the average number of days it takes a business to collect and convert its accounts receivables into cash. So as you can see here, we have Uber's average collection period. So for 2017 for Uber, we have 92.9. Um, 2018, um, it increased to 237.02. 20, um, and then in 2019, it decreased to 158.04. And then in 2020, it increased to 2.344.33. So and then in 2021, it decreased to 1.91.31. And so now I want to move on to Lyft's average collection period. So Lyft's average collection period here. Okay, so now I have Lyft's average collection period. So in 2017, we have 224.01, um, and then it decreased in 2018 to 207.55. And then in 2019 here, it increased to 216.69. And then in 2020, it increased again to 233.190. And then in 2021, 
and then in 2021, it decreased to 190.980. Okay, so now I wanna move on to total asset turnover. So total asset turnover is a financial ratio that measures the efficiency of a company's use of its assets in generating sales revenue or sales income to the company. So here we're looking at Uber's um, total asset, I'm sorry, Uber's total asset turnover. So for 2017 for Uber, we have 0 0.5, um, then it decreased in 2019, sorry, 2018 to 0 0.4, and then in 20, um, 2019, it um, decreased also to 0 0.40, and then in 2020, it decreased even more to 0 0.33, and then in 2021, it increased to 0 0.45. And now I wanna show you guys lifts total asset turnover. So let's see here. So Lyft. So Lyft total asset turnover in 2017 we have 0. Point, we have 0. 0.35 um, for 2018 it decreased I'm sorry for 2018 it increased to 0. 0.57, 2019 it increased again to 0. 0.6 and 2020 it uh, decreased to 0. 0.47 and in 2021, it increased tremendously back up to 0 0.67. Okay, so now I wanna talk about fixed asset turnover. So fixed asset turnover is an efficiency ratio that indicates how well or efficiently a business uses fixed assets to generate sales. So as you can see here, we have Uber's fixed asset turnover. So Uber fixed asset turnover for 2017 was 0.11, um, and then it increased in 2018 to 0.14. Um, and then in 2019, it increased again to 0 0.18. And then we have here in 2020, it decreased to 0 0.15. And in 2021, it decreased, I'm sorry, in 2021, it increased to 0, 0, 2, 0 0.24. And so now I wanna show you Lyft's fixed asset turnover. So Lyft's fixed asset turnover, let's go to it quickly. So Lyft's fixed asset turnover. So Lyft fixed asset turnover. So for 2017, we have 35%, then it increased to 57%. For 2018, um, 2019, it increased again to 64%. And then in 2020, it decreased from 64% to 51%. And then in 2021, it increased from 51% to 67%. Okay, so now I wanna talk about the basic earning power for both Uber and Lyft. So the basic earning power is earnings before interest and taxes divided by total assets. So as you can see, the basic earning power for Uber um, for 2017 is negative 0 0.26, um, and then it decreased in 2018 to negative 0 0.12, and then in 2019, it increased to 0 point, I'm sorry, negative 0 0.27, and then in 2020, it decreased again to negative 0 0.14, and then in 2021, it decreased as well to negative 0.09. Okay, so now I wanna show you guys Lyft's basic earning power. So for 2017 for Lyft, the basic earning power, we have negative 23%. For 2018, we have negative 26%. For 2019, we have negative 47%. And for 2020, we have negative 39%. And for 2021, we have negative 24%. Okay, so now I wanna talk about the gross profit margin for both companies, Uber and Lyft. So the gross profit margin, so gross profit margin is calculated by subtracting direct expenses of, or, or cost of goods sold from net sales revenues minus returns, allowances, and discounts. So as you can see for Uber for um, 2017 for the gross profit margin, we have 0 0.4, um, and then it increased to 0 0.5 in 2018, and then it increased, I'm sorry, decreased in 2019 to 0 0.53 and then it decreased again in 2020 to 0 0.52, and then it increased, I'm sorry, it decreased in 2021 to 0 0.46. And now I wanna show you guys Lyft gross profit margin. So let's see here, Lyft gross profit margin. So for Lyft gross, pro gross profit margin, sorry, um, in 2017, we have 0 0.37, and then it increased in 2018 to 0 0.42, and then it decreased in 2019 to 0 0.39, and then it decreased in 2020 to 0 0.38, and then it increased in 2021 to 4.69. Okay, so now I wanna talk about the operating profit margin. So how we get the operate, operating profit margin is revenue minus cost over revenue. So the operating profit margin for Uber for 2017 was negative 0 0.51, 
Um, and then in 2018, we have negative 0 0.29. And then in 2019, we have negative 0 0.6. And then in 2020, we have negative 0 0.4. And then in 2021, we have negative 0 0.22. Now I want to move on to lift operating profit margin. So lift operating profit margin here. Just give me one second. So lift operating profit margin here. So for 2017, we have negative 0 0.66. 0 .66. For, 2020, for 2018, sorry, we have negative 0.45. For 2019, we have negative 0 0.74. And for 2020, we have negative 0 0.76. And for 2021, we have negative 0 0.35. Okay, so now I wanna talk about the net profit margin for both companies. So the net profit margin here um, for Uber, for 2017, we have negative 0.50. For 2018, we have 0 0.099. Uh, for 2019, we have negative 0 0.65, and then in 2020, we have negative 0 0.60, and then in 2021, we have negative 0 0.031. So now I'm going to move on to lifts, um, sorry, lifts, um, lifts net profit margin here. Um, so let's see. So lifts net profit margin. So in 2017 here for Lyft for the net profit margin, we have negative 0.64. Um, we have in 2018, we have negative 0 0.42. And then in 2019, we have negative 0 0.7. And then in 2020, we have negative 0 0.74. And then in 2021, we have negative 0 0.33. So now I want to talk about return on assets. So return on assets shows the percentage of how profitable a company's assets are in generating revenue. So to get return on assets, we do net income over total assets. So I want to show you guys um, Uber's return on assets. So Uber's return on assets for 2017 was negative 0.26. Um, for 2018, it was 0.04. For 2019, it was negative 0.26. For 2020, it was negative 0 0.20. And then for 2021, it was negative 0 0.013. And now I want to show you guys um, lift return on assets. So lift return on assets here. Just give me one second. So lift return on assets. So for 2017, for lift return on assets, we have um, negative 0 0.228. And then for 2018, we have negative 0 0.24. For 2019, we have negative 0 0.4. Um, for 2020, we have negative 0 0.3, um, and for 2021, we have negative 0.22. Okay, so now I want to talk about return on equity. So return on equity is a measure of the profitability of a business in relation to the equity. So how we get return on equity is net income over shareholders' equity. So now I want to talk about Uber's um, return on equity for 2017, which was 0 0.47, um, and then it increased in 2018 to 1.15. And then in um, 2020, I'm sorry, in 2019, it decreased to negative um, 0 0.455. And then in 2020, we have negative 0 0.522. And then in 2021, we have negative 0 0.033. And now I want to move on to lift return on equity. Give me one second here, lift return on equity. So lift return on equity for 2017 here, um, we have 0 0.3477. Um, and then in 2018, um, it decreased to 0 0.31. And then in 2019, it decreased tremendously to negative 0 0.912. And then in 2020, we have negative 1.04. Um, and then in 2021, we have negative 0 0.79. Okay, so now I wanna talk about the market value to book value. So this ratio is used to, to denote how much equity investors are paying for each dollar in their assets. The market, book, the market to book ratio is calculated by dividing the current closing price of the stock by the most current quarter book value per share. So moving on to Uber's um, market value to book value. For 2017, we have negative 1.5. For 2018, we have negative 2.01. For 2019, we have uh, 1.33. For 2020, we have 1.5. And for 2021, we have 1.4. So now I'm gonna move on to Lyft's market value to book value. 
for let's see here. So look market value to book value. Okay, so look market value to book value for 2017. We have negative 0.51. Um, for 2018, we have negative 6.37. For 2019, we have 1.0. For 2020, we have 1.38, and for 2021, we have 1.53. Okay, so now I want to move on to cash flow per share. So cash flow per share is the after-tax earnings plus depreciation on per share basis that functions as a measure of a firm's financial strength. So how we get cash flow per share is operating cash flow minus preferred dividends over total common shares outstanding. So now I want to move on to Uber's um, cash flow per share on Excel. For 2017, we have negative 1.04. For 2018, we have negative 5.73. Um, for 2019, we have negative 3.46. For 2020, we have negative 0 0.87. And for 2021, we have negative 0 0.75. And now let's go to Lyft's cash flow per share. So let's see Lyft's cash flow per share. So for Lyft's cash flow per share, um, for 2017, we have negative 2.09. Um, for 2018, we have negative 1.54. For 2019, we have negative 0, 0, negative 0 0.578. For 2020, we have negative 7.54. And for 2021, we have 0 0.55. Okay, so now I want to move on to the total net operating capital for both companies. So total net operating capital is the difference between a company's assets and current non-interest bearing current liabilities. So um, let's move on to Uber's um, total net operating capital. So for Uber, for 2017, we have negative, negative $205. Um, for 2018, we have $3,017. Um, and for 2019, it increased to $882.86. Um, uh, 2020, um, it decreased to 43.99, and in 2021, it decreased again to 29.90. So now let's move on to Lyft's total net operating capital. So let's see here. So Lyft's total net operating capital. Okay. So Lyft's total net operating capital. So for 2017, we have 1866. Um, and in 2018, we have 871. 2019, it decreased to 795. Um, and then in 2020, it um, decreased to 519. And then 2021, it decreased again to 259. Okay, so now we'll be moving on to the gross investment in operating capital. So as you can see, I have um, Uber's gross investment, gross investment in operating capital here. For 2017, we have negative 0.02. Um, for 2018, we have negative 0 0.33, and for 2019, we have negative 0 0.4, and for 2020, we have 0 0.07, and for 2021, we have negative 0 0.29. And now I want to show you guys Lyft Gross Investment Operating Capital. Just give me one second here. So, okay, so Lyft Gross Investment Operating Capital. Uh, for 2017, we have negative 1.04. For 2018, we have negative 0.95. For 2019, we have negative 0.9. For 2020, we have negative 0.38. And for 2021, we have negative 0.32. Okay, so now I want to talk about free cash flow. So free cash flow is the amount by which a business operating cash flow exceeds its working capital needs and expenditures on fixed assets. So the free cash flow for Uber for 2017, we have negative 0.03. Um, and then for 2018, we have negative 0.4. Then for 2019, we have negative 0.42. Um, and then for 2020, we have 0.05. Um, and then in 2021, we have negative 0.17. And so now I wanna talk about Lyft's um, free cash flow as well. So Lyft's free cash flow. Okay, so let's free cash flow. For 2017, we have negative 1.04. And for 2018, we have negative 0 0.96. And for 2019, we have negative 0 0.91. And for 2020, we have negative 0 0.39. And for 2021, we have negative 0 0.33. Okay, so now I want to talk about return on invested capital. So return on invested capital is, is a calculation used to assess a company's efficiency in allocating capital to profitable investments. So for Uber, for return on investment capital in 2017, we have negative 0.03. For 2018, we have negative 0.45. 
Um, for 2019, we have negative 0.42. For 2020, we have 0.05. For 2021, we have negative 0.17. And now I wanna move on to LIFT's return on invested capital. So for LIFT for return on invested capital, um, for 2017, we have negative 1.03. For 2018, we have negative 0.96. For 2019, we have negative 0.9. For 2020, we have negative 0.38. For 2021, we have negative 0.32. Okay, so now I wanna move on to market value added. So market value added is a calculation that shows the difference between the market value of a company and the, cap and the capital contributed by all investors. So the market value added for Uber for 2017, we have negative 21.23. For 2018, we have $235. Um, and then for 2019, we have $238, so it increased by $3. <laughs> and then for 2019, we have 76, 73, so it increased by a lot. And then in 2021, we have $10,832. So now I'm gonna get into Lyft market value added. One second, so Lyft market value added. So for Lyft market value added in 2017, we have 3,001. And then in 2018, we have 21.19. And then in 2019, we have $0. And in 2020, we have $0. And in 2021, we have 52.79. Okay, so now I wanna move on to the cost of capital for both companies. So starting out with Uber, with the cost of capital, um, we have co compute the after-tax cost of debt for the company. So the after-tax cost of debt for Uber would be negative 20.58%. And so now we're gonna move on to lifts. Um, cost of capital after tax. So Lyft's cost of capital after tax would be 5.20%. Okay, so now I wanna do the cost of capital with the internal equity and the external stock. So with the inter internal equity we have for Uber, we have 8.49% and for uh, the external stock, we have negative 0.15%. So for Lyft's internal equity and external stock, we have 13.04%. 13.06% for the internal equity, and for the external equity, we have 0.88%. Okay, so in conclusion, Uber's performance is good, but the company must take more precautions in financial management to control operating costs while improving profitability. This regards not only the prevailing inflation and post-pandemic situations, but also evidence provided in the analysis of Uber finances between 2017 and 2021. The largest competitor, Lyft, is not far behind with the ratios showing inconsistency. Lyft could outperform, Lyft could outperform Uber in some op operational areas, increasing its profitability margins. Uber should be keen on the marketing and promotional strategies applied while expanding to new markets. This is in consideration of domestic brands having competitive advantages. So far, its marketing position and emphasis on customer satisfaction have been vital in its growth but increasing revenues will consider additional strategies per market needs. Meanwhile, Lyft has been effective and consistent in penetrating the already established domestic market. The company has adopted other approaches since its market's entry as a carpooling company. Increasing its revenues will consider mergers and alliances with firms to expone on services such as um, I'm sorry, to expone, on, to expone on services offered to match Uber's growth strategy. This will facilitate an increase in revenues basis where Lyft can obtain commissions. Notably, both companies have been, keen to, have been keen on minimizing operational costs to achieve maximum profitability besides deploying effective marketing strategies. And that brings me to the end of my financial management project on Uber and Lyft. I hope you guys enjoyed it and thank you for watching.